actually going to work this time. Maybe it does. Is it working? I think we are. What's happening, everybody? Hope everybody's having an awesome whatever day it is for you when you're watching this. So, wanted to talk a little bit about humidity's effect on horsepower. If you guys live in an area that gets a little bit humid, you never wonder how much power that actually kills out of your car. If you're going to the drag strip quite a bit, you ever notice your car might be a little bit more sluggish? Well, there's some reasons for that. And so I wanted to visit with you guys a little bit about that. The reason why we're talking about this is because last night when I did that track chat, one of the things that I ran into was seriously high humidity, 95%. And keeping in mind that relative humidity is just that it's relative which means that you will have more water vapor displacing dry air when it's hot at the same relative humidity as you will at a cooler temperature with the same relative humidity but that's really not the point in this the the idea here the chat is really more to talk about some generalities. I don't want to get too specific. I don't want to break this down too much for you guys. But what I do want to do is give you guys kind of an overview as far as how it can affect your car and by how much. So let me check in with you guys real quick. We got Eric and we got Chuck in. I like it. Eric saying, good evening, Professor B. Mm, I got the arm flex. I like it. Chuck saying, good evening, uh, Mopar Brotherhood. What's up, man? So, we'll let a few, a few more folks climb on in. Hopefully, everybody's having a good weekend. If y'all didn't get a chance to see the track chat live, it doesn't really get good until I race that guy, and then it gets really good because I just about lose my mind uh, about, I don't know, eight-tenths of the way down the drag strip. Pretty funny, pretty funny stuff. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, the, last night it was crazy humid. And the issue with humidity is that it does sap power, but by how much? Well, what I wanna talk about are temperatures that you're probably gonna be driving your car in if you're going to the drag strip. Let's play with some numbers here. We're really talking about temperatures between 65 degrees and 85 degrees. Yeah, I basically going to try to cover all the conditions you might be running in. Um, <laughs> Chuck saying he missed part two from the race. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta roll that into it just a little bit. Uh, we basically here's, I'll, I'll give you the, I'll give you the cliff notes version of it. Uh, I ended up running a CTSV that looked to be pretty healthy and it, I didn't really mention this in the video, but it had one of those those panoramic cameras attached to the top of the car. Um, you know, the one that looks like a vibrating electric toothbrush? Any, anyway, uh, it was flashing green. I, I don't know what the deal was. I had a, he was kind of posturing up to race me. I don't know if he meant to do that or not, but that's the way I took it. At least that's the way I internalized it. My internal dialogue went there with it. Anyway, long story short, um, you know, the CTSVs, man, you never know about those cars. They'll either be a, they're kind of like the stripped down NA Mustangs. They're either a, a, an 11 second car, a, a low 10 second car, or a nine second car. Anyway, I didn't want to lose on the tree to this guy either. So I dropped a 007 light on him. So anyway, if you guys get the opportunity, check out the back half of that take two video. It's actually, you might come away from it a little bit, uh, a little bit entertained. Anyway, um, getting back to the, the relative humidity or the humidity and how it affects horsepower. So in knowing that the hotter it is, that uh, a relative humidity number will carry more water. You'll have more water vapor displacing the air as temperature goes up. Now you might think, well, if the water, if the water grains in essence, are displacing free oxygen, then that must mean that your density altitude is going down. That's not the case at all. In fact, it actually rises because what you're measuring when you're measuring density altitude in this case 
what you're what you're thinking about is the actual weight of the air along with the water vapor. And that's what I'm talking about. You're thinking about the extra, just the weight of the air plus the water vapor. Um, 7,000 grains of water per pound, 13.1 uh, pounds of air in a, uh, in a cubic yard, I believe is what it was. So anyway, long story short, or I'm sorry, in a 13.8 uh, cubic feet in a pound of air, sorry. Um, trying to do this off of memory here, and I'm going back to a, an air filter video that I did, and this is stuff that I haven't even thought about really since then, and since I was messing around with a bunch of aviation stuff, which is where all of this stuff comes from, by the way. Um, density altitude is a big deal. Uh, humidity can play a big part of that as well. So anyway, high levels of humidity actually make the DA go uh, well, basically it'll, you know, drop the DA. So it looks like you've got more available oxygen. In fact, you don't, you have less available oxygen and a heavier air mass. What does heavier air mass do? Well, it creates more uh, aerodynamic drag on whatever contraption is going through it. So these are things that will affect your ET. And it's not just the fact that you're displacing free available oxygen in the air, but you're displacing it at a higher air weight, a higher density altitude. In other words, the density altitude drops. But in this case, again, you're only thinking about it as a form of a media that you're driving your car through. It has nothing to do with actual available oxygen that your engine can actually grab and consume. So these are the things that kind of throw people off. So what's the net effect? Okay, I'm over here yammering on about all this gobbledygook about nerd sound and stuff. What's the net effect? Well, in walking around temperatures, again, 65 degrees to 85 degrees, for example, the net loss in power, available free horsepower, is going to be, and, and again, this is going to vary 65 to 85 degrees. Now we're going to start talking about relative humidity numbers of, say, 40 to 50 percent to 93 to 97 percent. So we've got to have a bit of a range here to talk about. And we're talking about kind of a median, you know, the fat part of that bell curve that you're going to be running your car in. I don't want to talk about the outlying stuff. So the net effect is roughly one and a quarter to about one and a half percent in terms of actual power production. So that sounds like an awful lot. And it also should be fairly recognizable to you guys that are used to talking about things in terms of density altitude. For you guys that don't know that the walking around number for naturally aspirated and fixed drive supercharging systems is 3% loss per thousand feet of altitude, physical real altitude traveled upwards. It also plays out the same for density altitude. Your car at zero altitude, in other words, sea level adjusted altitude, will have 3% more power than it will at 1,000 feet. Barometric pressure, all that, we're not even talking about that because we know you're going to lose BP as you go up. But we're also talking about water vapor for water vapor. All of that being the same, you're going to lose that power as you go up. For you aviation guys out there, I'm not going to talk about internal losses versus actual air mass losses. There's a percentage there. It, it That's not how this is going to play out. I'm just going to talk about actual horsepower for this because guys racing, they're not worried about internal frictional losses. But in case you're wondering, internal frictional losses also include things like front engine accessory drive on your car alternator, water pump, power steering pump, vacuum pumps, anything else that the engine is turning, you think of those as fixed costs. Well, let's say your fixed cost is 35 horsepower. If your engine makes 200 horsepower uh, at zero altitude and it makes, say, 150 horsepower at 5,000 feet, your fixed parasitic loss and internal frictional losses are all still going to be 35 horsepower, roughly. 
there's some variation there because of piston drive forces, things like that. But you're still going to be looking at roughly 35 horsepower, which is now a larger percentage parasite drag of what your actual available to work horsepower is. Anyway, you know where I'm going with that. I didn't want to get too deep into that, but I wanted to at least wade into the water to let you know I'm not going to be talking about that, even though I literally just got through talking about that. So what does, let's let's call it 1.4% or one and a quarter percent. What does that translate to that loss uh, going from say a 40% uh, relative humidity day to a 95% relative humidity day barometric pressure and temperature all being roughly the same. Well, it's kind of hard to calculate because you have to know what the car is going to be trapping at the back half of the track. But let's say that your car on a, we'll take uh, we'll take Revlon for example. Uh, that car should trap, let's call it 130 miles an hour cuz 133, 134 whatever. Let's say a car very similar to Revlon where you're going to track 130, or let's go, I've got some numbers up here too, let's say 120 miles an hour for you NA guys, because this might help you guys, this will help anybody again with a fixed ratio drive on any supercharger. Oh, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because this doesn't necessarily, although it does affect turbochargers, doesn't affect them as much. Turbochargers have a very broad window of which they will be able to make their peak rated horsepower because of how turbos work. But something that is belt driven and is only a single stage uh, supercharger is going to have a metered amount of air that it brings in per revolution at a certain RPM. So anyway, what does one and a quarter percent, one point four percent, whatever we're talking about here. How does that translate? Well, at one hundred and twenty. Oh, so this is another thing I wanted to try to say. It, it, this is really hard to visualize, and this is not necessarily the right way to try to play this out. But it seems like it worked out for my car, so it might work out for you too. Should this is kind of a sleight of hand math, by the way. So if you think of it as you've got a 1.4% loss in power, you think of it a different way. Think of it as though you've extended the quarter mile by 1.4%. In this case, you have 1,320 feet. It's like you're extending it 13.2 feet. So how much time is it going to take you to traverse that extra 13.2 feet? Well, I'm going to use 120 miles an hour. I've got 100, 120, and 130 that I just kind of road over here on the dry erase board. So at 120 miles an hour, say you've got a really strong running naturally aspirated car. Um, that's 176 feet per second. 176 feet per second um, is going to translate to with basically, uh, you know, a 1% loss of that going to go to 1.2 miles per hour, which brings you to I, on the other side of this thing, 174.2 feet per second. So to cover that 13 feet, which is about, uh, it's a little bit more than half a car length, length is going to take you about 0 0.075 of a second. In other words, it's not a tenth of a second, but it's really encroaching on that tenth of a second. And if you notice, if you think of it in those types of terms, uh, I can tell you that for my car, uh, at 130 miles an hour, losing that 1% equated to me dropping, uh, or is 1.4% is what I think I, no, I only used 1% for, for all of these, by the way, because I wanted to try to bring the lowest common denominator down on this. Um, it turned out to be about 0 0.07 or about seven hundredths of a second, which, you know, I'm sure the math isn't right, but eerily enough, that's about how far my car was off going 1040 versus like a 1033 or a 1035. So we're within the noise, okay? We're with, given what we're working with and, and the constraints of what we're kind of trying to figure out here, like get a mental image of. 0 0.7, point or 0 0.07, 0 0.075, 
at 100 miles an hour, it'd be even longer because it, you're not going as fast to cover the same amount of distance. So the math doesn't really work out in all directions, but I can tell you this, again, this is just me trying to, to brainstorm something uh, real quick to get a, a visual on this. But let me give you an idea, another way of looking at it. Uh, a very humid day is, there, there's enough of, a, of, a, of an effect on your ET to where if a thousand feet is worth a tenth, for my car, then high humidity is worth at least half a tenth, given the same temperature for temperature, barometric pressure for barometric pressure. So you know, what's it worth? Well, it's at least worth half a tenth. And I'll say that from what I've been able to gather with my car, it pretty much holds up all the way across the board. Real high humidity day versus a, like a standard walking around 40% humidity day can kill you by half a tenth and it doesn't sound like a lot. But you got to remember that you're playing in a game where you start to measure thousands of a second. You for, you, your foregone conclusion is tense. I mean, tense in this world. And, and, and again, I've got to like remind some folks. The hell is that? Anyway. A tenth of a second. So think about think about it like this. At 120 miles per hour, your car in a tenth of a second will travel almost 18 feet. At 120 miles an hour, you're basically traveling a car length every tenth of a second. You're traveling 176 feet per second. It's pretty crazy when you think about it. By the way, fun fact, 200 miles an hour is roughly 300 feet per second. It's a football field per second, basically. But again, the idea here is that you are trying to collect feet at this stage. When you start really breaking down the actual amount of time that it's taking you to cover a certain distance. So that's why... All of these thousandths of a second, really when you're trying to cover a number, really do become daunting. When you've got cars that are as reliable and as consistent as these cars can be. So anyway, whole lot of math, whole lot of what is he talking about going on. But I haven't had a chance to professor up in a while and I figured I would bring you guys kind of into the fold a little bit, give you a little bit of an idea for what I was thinking about when, you know, the car ran these numbers and I the, the high humidity. And that's why I was asking in the live feed, hey, what's the humidity? You know, what was the temperature on that? What's the humidity? And when the number came back at like 95%, it's like, holy crap, this car is screaming for the conditions. So I think the first pass was at 82 or 88% humidity, something pretty, pretty crazy. But Anyway, let me check in with you guys real quick. KDC saying, what up, Macy? Got the flex. I like it. Shift is saying, saying, what up, B? Oh, where am I saying? Here we go. Uh, what's happening? <laughs> and he's saying, hey, Brian, Modern Red saying, sup, Professor B, what's up? James is asking, is this car racing or a science project? It's a little bit of both. Hey, listen, you say that, so last night, you want to talk about science project, you think I'm rambling on about some stuff, hang out around bracket racer guy. Let me tell you something, I was saying this last night, but it does bear repeating. Bracket racer guy has had the same car for 25 years. Bracket racer guy has had the same big block heads, ring pack, camshaft, everything, the same combination in this car. It'll, it'll look like a bucket with big tires, but his tow rig will out, will have, you, he will have outspent most people in their housing endeavors in his tow rig and trailer. These guys have got weather stations and like observatory stuff going on. It will blow your mind, but I kid you not, you will see a rig that will have a tow rig that just the tow tractor itself is like a $100,000, $120,000 unit. 
the trailer looks like something that you would see, like, it just, it, it would blow your mind. It's like a professional race racing thing with living quarters and all this other stuff jammed into these things. This is what they do. And so, yeah, I'm not telling these guys anything they don't know. If anything, they're probably hammering it. I just got to know that. What are you talking about? Look, listen, you talk about science project. These guys are like, they will get their car down to the fabric fibers of, oh, it's just crazy. Anyway, um, Rift is in. Modern Red Hemi is saying both. Um, Modern Red is saying a tenth, you're getting gapped. Literally. So to that point, at 130 miles an hour, a tenth of a second is 19 feet. That is a full ass car length. All right, the difference here is huge. And, you know, let's say you lose, what did I write down over here? I, I did this here, 1.3 mile an hour loss. I know it's not exact, but it'll get you in the ballpark. You know, 0 0.07 seconds. It, it doesn't sound like a lot. And, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna trap that down, or I'm gonna chop that down to five going through the traps. It doesn't seem to sound like a lot, but Dude, if you've ever seen the difference between a 1035 and a 1030, it's like this going through the going through the traps. You're literally looking at the entire whole ass of the other car, man. You've lost and it wasn't close. And usually at that level, one of two things is happening. Either you're trying to reel somebody in and something went terribly wrong at the launch or they're still moving away from you. So yeah, 19 feet is when you start describing things in feet, that's when it becomes real. That's when it becomes tangible. And it's when the speeds of these things really start to come into, well, they, they, they kind of become a little bit more relatable. And again, you know, at even at speeds of, here's a good one for you, at 100 miles an hour. You guys remember first time y'all went drag racing, man, 100 miles an hour, car, your goal was to go 100 miles an hour in the quarter. I know mine was at 100 miles an hour, you're traveling 147 feet per second. In a tenth of a second, you'll go the length of a Mustang GT, 14.7 feet, or at least a Fox body or there, thereabouts, but you know what I'm talking about. You're gonna go a car length just at 100 miles an hour. Spread that out to 130 and it's just like, what is going on here? It's a lot more distance. Chuck's saying, is it necessary to science out or just pin the throttle to the firewall? <laughs> well, that's what we're doing. But I know a lot of guys really wanna get into the, the effects of atmospheric conditions, but the, more to the point, it's the density altitude. See, I get a lot of guys go, well, what was the density altitude? The density altitude, density altitude, density. It's almost like it's a nervous tick. And it's also why I always try to include DA figures and why I always say for all of the conditions, please go to HRP slips, pull up my car number, which for the year 2022 is 1182. And it'll give you everything that you need. I got barometric pressure on there. It's got um, uh, humidity. It's got uh, elevation of the track and density altitude. It's got everything that you need. Or you can plug it, uh, plug in the seven seven five two one or whatever the zip code is to it uh, for weather underground. Just go weather underground, Houston, Texas. Look up the day, you can see the dew point, the temperature variance, you can see humidity, you can see all of that. So it gives you the opportunity to correct your car. But the difference here, though, is that guys just want to know, well, what was the DA? And oh, yeah, you're running your car in really low DA, it doesn't count. What the fuck? I still don't get that argument. I mean, ain't nobody keeping nobody from packing up their stuff and heading down to here or Florida or the East Coast if you want to capture some really good air. Oh, wait, that's not something you can do? Oh, well, sucks for you. Uh, so anyway, the idea, though, is that if, if you can't make it, then you've got an opportunity to be able to say, okay, well, in density altitude for density altitude, here's where I'm at. However, humidity does come into play. So you can't really say, well, it was a super low density altitude, Here's the thing, 
last night, the density altitude wasn't that high. It was 750 on, on my second pass, and it was 825, I don't know, something like that on my first pass. Uh, the car went quicker in the higher density altitude. You might go, well, that didn't make any sense. It does when you think about the fact that it was a lower humidity value. So lower humidity, even though I had a higher density altitude, the car went quicker. So when the car went at 10.40 on that second pass, I was actually kind of surprised. The reason why I was kind of surprised at that was because humidity was so high, everything was sticky and clammy. Like you could feel it just, eh, like you didn't want to touch anything plastic was slimy and not slimy and like a, hey, it's kind of slimy. It was like bad, like gross. So anyway, that's what we were up against. And so again, you know, it's just one of these opportunities to say, hey, listen, yeah, I was running in this just under a thousand foot density altitude. But then I got to thinking about it last night. I was saying, you know, I don't typically run in that density altitude. Typically the density altitude that I will run in is either like zero, some negative, but maybe up to 700 and maybe 750. But those are cool, dry 750 DA days. Usually if it's 800 to 1200, a lot of times during those conditions, it's raining. Um, that's just like a weird kind of a crossroads between barometric pressure and temperature and it just usually it's kind of a wet, sticky, gross day. In fact, if you go back and you look at that very first pass that I make, a bit of an Easter egg, it looks like I'm driving off or driving into a, a storm. I mean, it's just super dark clouds the whole bit. And as a matter of fact, it was sprinkling earlier that day uh, before I even went to the drag strip. So just, you know, again, lower barometric pressure, kind of a funky temperature, weird density altitude, surprised we we're even able to run at all. And the car did, like I say, the car did way better, especially when you consider the fact that I'm running uh, back in normal conditions. In other words, I've got the passenger seat in the car and, you know, everything's in the car, basically, uh, that, you know, for, you know, road trip duty. <laughs> so, uh, aside from the drag pack. Let me check up with you guys. Hunter saying, to the average racer, it matters. You just didn't know it. The, the pros take this to the extreme, especially the bracket racers. For sure they do. Uh, Chuck saying, performance knowledge goes beyond the hot big block rumbling in the front these days. Yeah, it's true. Oh, Chuck saying, yeah, I'm sure the pros geek out over it. They do, big time. Um, knowledge is power, literally. Hey, I like that. That's very true. Modern's live. Chuck saying, oh, he's hanging out with Modern Say, I admire your RT shaker. I drive the same car in six speed. Nice. <laughs> Reggie will say, thought me was bugging while you're talking about that sticky assist. Eh, just didn't want to touch anything. Everything was just, eh. Like you knew it, 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 it was, oh, perfect thing. So shop is sweating big time. Like you would not believe. So anyway, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that, that was fun. <laughs> oh, Modern saying, Chuck, looking for a 1037 tomorrow, kind of fast for just a 5.7. Get out there and run it. Chuck saying, sweet, sounds cool. I like it. Um, but anyway, that's, that's some of the stuff I, you know, when it comes to, you know, talking numbers and relative humidity type stuff and how does that affect the car? Well, the thing is, is that, so you guys know how much data logging I do. And so when I say that, that, you know, high humidity had the car, uh, basically kind of bottoming out in a, in a timing table, it's because the car is reading an air charge, an air density, so to speak, that is putting the car basically thinking that the air density is higher. So, well, it's it's affecting the 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 sensors to where it's saying, okay, well, we need a lower timing, and um, 
that is something that can happen on real high humidity days. I was not data logging the car, but I can assure you that I was running in a row just because of my experience data logging that car. I was, I was running that car in a row that would have been like, I normally wouldn't run that timing set that those timing values, unless realistically the the DA would have been probably another 500 feet lower at least with drier air for sure. Monterey said, here it comes. This is why it matters. Yeah. So, um, when I'm, when I'm looking at the data, this is something that you have to be real cognizant of is if it's real humid, you know, you're going to be hemorrhaging timing. That's just the way that these cars work. Uh, they, they are measuring, uh, atmospheric pressure, and again, higher water grains are going to show to be a higher actual weight of the available air. Your yeah, thirteen one point one pounds of uh, of dry air uh, is now going to look well. It's going to be heavier, and that's what's going to make the car think that, that there's just more available oxygen than there may well be. So. This is stuff that I look at. This is the kind of nerd stuff that I like to do. And, you know, when I'm looking at data logs and I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, density altitude. Oh, and this is also here. Yeah. You talk about here it comes. This is also one of the reasons why uh, it's, it's not a good idea to try to throw timing at the car in these types of conditions. And so the idea I, I I'm, I'm already kind of thinking like you're thinking, well, if it's humid, couldn't you just throw more timing at it in the rows where you know that the air charge is going to be showing to be high, but you have less available oxygen, which in this case would be the case. The short answer to that is absolutely you could, and you would if you're at a race event and you're really trying to gun down or run a number, whatever the case might be, and these are the conditions that you're dealing with. You might have it saved in your in your uh, in your tuned file bases. High humidity, um, a, a high humidity tune or something like that. Um, and what you do is you throw an extra degree of timing at some real low uh, density altitude values. You may even go as high as a degree and a half, and then blend that back up, interpolate it up. The problem comes is where the problem comes into play is if you try to get greedy with that number. So here's what ends up happening. You put the timing in the car and let's say you're running it on pump gas the way that I am. And you're not really talking about an E85 specific tune. But let's say that's the case. What ends up happening is, is you're going to leave that tune in the car. You're going to forget that that tune's in the car. And the next time you take the car to the drag strip, you might think to yourself, well, that tune worked really well. Let's see how it works in this real low humidity condition. Well, in the low humidity condition, and it's about the same temperature outside. And let's say you just don't snap to the fact that it's a low humidity day. It just seems really pretty outside. Everything feels nice and dry. <laughs> well, everything will be dry and not including your eyes, uh, if you're running that thing on a fuel that doesn't have very good knock, uh, it doesn't deal well with knock, uh, knock resistance, what will end up happening is you may uh, be freaking out your knock sensors, in these Hellcats at least, and that's assuming that your knock sensors are set accordingly or at least properly and to your application, and you end up losing power through those means, if not worse. And so, that's why it's important to just, for me anyway, I've kind of got to set it and forget it kind of mentality when it comes to the tune on the car. I'm very Ron Popeil pocket fisherman type when it comes to that thing because I, I don't want to try to cheat. I don't want to try to cover a number when it's just so funky and dank outside that, you know, it, it's just, you're, you're not going to cover a number anyway. And it's better to err on the side of caution with these things, especially with fuel quality being what it is, 
you want to make sure that you're at least not trying to cheat into a number uh, only to end up seriously pissing off your knock sensors or uh, if you've got an older like old school Diablo tune or something like that a lot of those cars have already been retuned or have injured themselves into a rebuild with a retune mm. so <laughs> I love that. this is why it matters but um but no yeah last night was a lot of fun and um but it was kind of interesting because it, it last night was neat because it was just fun to be racing and um you know just being out there and getting the car down the drag strip without really worrying too much about covering a number that's when racing for me becomes fun again you know and um I think we did pretty good this year. You know, ran a 10.08, 10.10, uh, 10.12, 10.13. Uh, I don't even, did I run a 10.11? I think the only number I didn't run was an 11. Uh, 14s in there, 15s, 16s. Basically had proven that the car will run a 10.10 in the configuration that, you know, I kind of gave a rule to myself about what the configuration was going to have to be. Um, but it, it did that number and it ran teens in, you know, pretty solid string of teens in positive density altitude. So, you know, for the guys that were really concerned about DA, my car ran a teen, a couple of teens and a couple of low twenties in DA that was positive, albeit with low humidity. So, you know, and that, that kind of also brings me back to this point. The car was never... I never thought the car would be in the 20s unless it was in like good, significant, negative density altitude. I just never really thought that it would get there, frankly. So, um, you know, for, for what it's worth, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty stoked with how that car is running. So it's one of the reasons why I'm not throwing pulleys at it or anything else like that. Chuck said, hey, B, would the DA affect a NASCAR race uh, way longer duration than drag racing? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, density, altitude, humidity, all of that is going to affect the NASCAR race. But the NASCAR race is a little bit different, just like an endurance race, because now you're dealing with dynamic conditions. A, drag, a dragster, drag racing, any, anybody going down a drag strip has to deal with the conditions for, you know, call it 10 seconds. 12 seconds, 15 seconds, whatever speed their car is running. Um, and the longer they're staying where they're at, then their next pass will be affected by the DA at that time of going down the track. But as the cars are going around the track, if it's an endurance race, a NASCAR race or something like that, absolutely density altitude will start to affect that. DA, as the, as the temperature goes up, that'll start to affect tire pressures. Um, as the the DA is going up, temperature is going up, can affect cooling in some cases. So it, yeah, it can absolutely affect all of that. I need more purple. Luckily, the store did me good. Mm. But yeah, no, it, it will absolutely affect it. But the good thing is it affects every car the same. Cody's saying, what's going on, B? Just got home from a family party. Nice. My take on weather is hot weather and turbos don't mix. No, they don't. No, they don't, but it, they do mix better than uh, naturally aspirated or belt-driven superchargers. That's for sure. Gary's saying, hey, B, on Tuesday you said to make sure TCM torque management is enabled on the tune. Yep. Uh, you're talking about external trans torque management on the bottom of the page, right? That is correct. Very bottom of the page, left-hand side. That's where you're going to find it. Modern Red saying percent humidity versus water grains. So water grains is a, is a absolute measurement of the grains that are in your cubic meter of air, so to speak. So 7,000 grains of water per pound of or 7,000 grains in one pound of water. And in dry air, 
in a cubic meter. Yeah, in cubic, I believe that's how it works. Cubic meter, there's 13.1 pounds of air. Uh, anyway, um, the more grains you have, the higher the temperature, the more grains you can have. And it's an absolute measurement. So it has... It's the it, it's akin to relative humidity, but it's not actual relative humidity. It's an actual measurement of the amount of water that is in that cubic, whatever it is, foot, yard, mile of air that you're working with. And more to the point, it will tell you how much displaced dry air you're working with. So hopefully that, that helps you along the way with that. But grains are a lot better are, are a very good indicator of what you're working with in terms of actual air per cubic, whatever volume you want to work with. Relative humidity is just like with grains, always going to go up in terms of actual water vapor mass with higher temperatures. At least the capacity is there. So in other words, at 70 degrees at 50% relative humidity, you will have more water vapor than you would have at 50 degrees with the same relative humidity number. So anyway, uh, but yeah, water grains is certainly better. Uh, and, and the way that it usually works is the obviously the lower the grains, the more available oxygen you have to work with because there's no displacement there. But don't forget, higher water grains can still show as a lower density altitude. Same idea as what we're talking about with relative humidity. 9X saying, how are you? Thanks for going live tonight. Thank you, Modern Red. Thank you very much, buddy. I appreciate that. <laughs> Got the speeding hippo over there. I like that one. That one's cool. Um, <laughs> I'll, you can see it on my end. <laughs> I like that. That was fun. Um, thank you very much, buddy. Uh, 9X is saying, uh, will the side effects of humidity for the Pro Charger be in the group with turbos or top-mounted superchargers? It's belt-driven, it's belt driven, so it would be the same as a positive displacement supercharger. Uh, the same idea will hold correct. In other words, if you have a supercharger that is a single-stage engine, crankshaft, belt, or otherwise driven off of a reciprocating mass, that is going to, in essence, follow in the same line as a naturally aspirated engine. The difference would come with multiple stage or multiple speed supercharging, which you ain't got, so you don't have to worry about it. But uh, it, that's something that's an aviation based thing that we're looking at with that. It's that's not an automobile thing, at least for what purposes we're talking about. Mm. And the reason why turbos have a much wider, much broader uh, power delivery window is because they're exhaust driven. So they're exhaust driven, meaning that that impeller doesn't rely on engine speed, only engine output to create boost. So at a certain RPM at a certain altitude, you will generate enough back pressure in that exhaust housing, or at least enough force to spin that compressor through your exhaust gas to open up the wastegate or to start to crack the wastegate. In other words, to put it on the spring, for example. At that point, you have reached your manifold pressure. So let's say you've got a 12 pound spring and it's a turbo and you're at sea level. All it means is that you're gonna get to 12 pounds of manifold pressure a lot sooner than if you were at 10,000 feet, somewhere up in the mountains, for example. You would have to be on that gas for a while. It's gonna to start to build pressure. It'll build up pressure. You'll have a more lag time, but once it builds up the pressure, then you open up the wastegate and now you're just hammering the thing with all of the, the, the power basically that you would look for parasitic losses, notwithstanding and internal losses, notwithstanding that you would find at, at sea level. That's why airplanes, 
uh, and typically 99 nowadays, 99 out of 100 times, air aviation power plants are not supercharged. They're, for the most part, turbocharged because a turbocharger, you can, there are, there's a lot of reasons. There's no throttling losses. You don't have to worry about overboost with turbochargers. You don't have to worry about any of that. Superchargers, you have to gear the supercharger for a specific actual altitude that you're flying at. You'll have a range, obviously, but uh, you have to gear them for that. So if you, you can't just firewall an airplane with a supercharger, you have to actually throttle into it in some cases uh, if it is supercharged because you firewall the thing and there's no safety guards in place, what can happen is you will literally overboost the engine and pop the thing right there on the, on the runway. So anyway, turbos are really good because they're super user friendly. You can just basically lean over on the throttle, firewall the thing, uh, let it go to boost, fly it. There's no, there's no worrying about, um, about throttling losses and you can make peak power in low density altitude conditions and low density altitude for an airplane is a problem because not only if you've got a naturally aspirated engine, not only are you not making the power that you need to make, but your prop can't grab as much air and your wings don't have as much air to get lift from. So you've got to go down the runway faster. Um, you're, it's going to take you longer to get there because your engine ain't making the power and your prop isn't grabbing the air and you don't have the lift until you're really screaming down the runway. So, um, uh, low DA, uh, flight, or, I'm sorry, low DA takeoff, uh, procedures. Uh, basically what it is, you just, you're, you're taking off. If you ever train for it, you just take off at a lower throttle setting if you're training for it. Um, and if you're lucky, you live in an area where you've got a real long runway. Anyway, long story short, I'm getting kind of way off base here, but anyway, this is where all of this stuff comes from is aviation stuff. Anybody that's ever been in and around pilots or anything like that, th this is something that they would have had to have uh, studied and gotten really good at being able to calculate or just know off the top of their head. And with experience, you just kind of are able to rattle off, you know, yeah, 65 degrees at, at a thousand feet is going to put me, you know, at you know, roughly 1200 feet DA with this temperature and, you know, this relative humidity or whatever, you know, you just kind of, it's just, it's, it's a second language. Those guys really know how to speak well. But anyway, I digress. Scott saying, get even big at the arm flex. <laughs> Modern Red saying, dropping knowledge left and right. A little bit. <laughs> Chuck saying, all I know is on a cool, dry day, my shaker temp runs lower and my Challenger runs a few tenths faster. That's right, it will. Uh, I think we covered this before, but it relates to tonight's topic. That is right. Chuck saying, I love the performance pages giving me temp numbers for sure on that. Um, but yeah, no, it's just kind of fun to, you know, kind of nerd out every once in a while and talk about stuff like this. And, um, you know, it's it's just putting, you know, the phrase putting a face with the name. This is kind of doing the same thing, just explaining a little bit why your car basically on a cool, dry day runs better than it does on a hot, humid day or on any humid day for that matter. And it's just, again, just a little bit of, a, of an overview. And, and for, you know, for most guys, they just know on a cool day, the car runs better. But, you know, some guys do want to kind of dive into it a little bit more. Uh, and again, you know, anybody that's aviation, uh, has any experience with aviation type stuff, this is all like, yeah, that's what we do all the time. What's funny is that it's every, every pilot that I've ever known has been really like more into hot rodding, but more into this side of hot rodding where you're like, you break it down and bracket racing and things like that. <laughs> the hardcore pilot types are the ones that can really get into bracket racing. Cause that's literally what they did for a living uh, for their entire career was, you know, base an engine's performance off of atmospheric conditions. Cause your life literally depends on it. Um, so, 
uh, you know, their, their main thing is how long will it take for this contraption to get down the runway and airborne to it? It's a 50 foot obstacle clearance thing. And, uh, anyway, long story short, you hang around these guys and some of the stories, especially for these older Bush pilots and, uh, you know, just some of these dudes are really, really funny. Some of the, when I was a docent at Hiller, some of the guys that I worked with were uh, Vietnam pilots, uh, a couple of World War II guys, but uh, uh, Vietnam era pilots, Korean War era pilots. So uh, F-86 guys, uh, uh, like the World War II guys, had a couple of Navy guys, uh, a couple of, of uh, European theater guys. Anyway, the balance of them, though, uh, whether it didn't matter who they were flying for at the time, most of them ended up flying for Pan Am or American Airlines. And the shit, dude, you think the war stuff was, is, uh, oh, wow, the war stuff. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, the civil aviation stories are the ones that you just go, what? Because there was a time in, in history where there's a, a lot, anything went. Boy, howdy. Hmm. The other funny thing about these guys is that they, I don't know, so they were in their like late 60s, 70s, 80s in some cases. Didn't matter. They all smoked Dunhill cigarettes and drank coffee that was mixed to the consistency of motor oil. Like this stuff would put you in the spirit world. And that's how they, their morning started off with like half a pack of Dunhills and half a pot of this freaking wake up Elvis coffee. It, it was, it was like the stuff from Prometheus, man. Like if you weren't used to this stuff, it would like eat your face off, but that's just how they did things. Um, but anyway, just really cool group of guys that I got to work with and, and some of the stories from these guys were hysterical, man. Good Lord, these guys were funny. So, um, let's see. Cody saying, uh, long story short, ran into the newer uh, GR86, ran in from a dig and ate him alive. It was hype because we were uh, playing each other uh, or so at the light. I remembered your advice and launched at 1400. Sweet. That's the way to do it. Chuck, holy crap. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, buddy. If I live closer to you, I would coerce you into getting a drum set so we can jam at your shop. <laughs> for real, B. Thank you for giving me the tools to become better muscle car driver. Man, thank you very much, buddy. And thank you so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, man, listen. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to see me on drums. I look like a wounded duck having a fit. Um, but yeah, man, I tell you what, I, um, man, I really do appreciate that, buddy. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's funny. I, you know, in talking to like, you know, talking about musical instruments and stuff like that, I, at one point, like I would play it around with bass just because I like the sound of it, but I never really learned how to play anything. Um, but you'd always pick up on intros to things like uh, the intro to tools, 46 and two schism, stuff like that. I would just sit there and goof off. Like I'd be literally watching something and just listening to the noise that the thing was making. So I'd at least, you know, get the, the, the finger placement. Um, I had a buddy of mine though that was, that did a lot of studio drumming back in the, God, this is like back in the early 2000s. Anyway, he was a studio musician and he, he still rocks out. He's got his, his drum, uh, haven't talked to him in years, but he's got a, he's got a room in his house that is just for his drums and this drum kit. Anyway, it's pretty cool stuff, man. He gets in there and puts his, puts his ears on and just rocks out. But, uh, yeah, I just, man, I, I, that's something I wish I would have done, uh, is, is learn and let me rephrase this. I wish I would have kept practicing instruments 
that I, I started out with. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, buddy. I appreciate that a ton, very much. Um, Cody's saying, oh, Cody's saying he ate him alive in his escape. <laughs> Thought I had to calm down and drive. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, Chuck's saying he's been a professional bassist since he was 14. Oh, cool, man. Uh, I've played thousands of shows. Yeah, man, I've had friends that were musicians and, um, but yeah, that, that was always the thing that I liked the, I just like, I, I like the bass just because I like the way that it sounded and it was just something cool and different. And, uh, you know, was, was always a, you know, a big fan of, of any, any song that had hard bass riffs in it. I always liked that. So anyway, it's really awesome. That's, that's super cool. I didn't know that, uh, You've been a, a pro bassist for that long. What was the bass that I had? I had a five string when I was living in Dallas. That's the one that I ended up just kind of running across. And I forget the name. It was actually a pretty cool, pretty cool five string. Anyway, I ended up selling it uh, when I moved. And again, I would just like, I, I never really, I didn't play it. I would just try to pick up on certain things. So kind of a, a, a passing thing just because, you know, I was, keeping myself occupied, I guess. But that's really cool. I wish I wish I would have uh wish I would have taken lessons or you know just learned better. You know the one God everybody just this is you talk about a bass player is just cringe. But um you know I, I some of the stuff that sounds really complicated um, like any, any of the tool intros that those sound complicated, but they're actually kind of easy to, 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 to learn how to pick up on. I cannot do the freaking triplicate to American life. I have tried a Brazilian times. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I know that's cringy as hell, but, uh, you know, if you're into bass guitar, if just the bass riffs or anything like that, just you know different songs that you pick like how do they do that like how do they you know, you know you're, you're you're like i'm i'm, I'm muting but i'm not muting I, i'm anyway long story short that that was something i tried to any, anyway it'd have been better off if i had just hit my forehead on this on the on the freaking strings but um but awesome man. i appreciate it buddy i i can i can yammer on about stuff that i that's something i know nothing about um there was a time, so I, when I was in school, I loved saxophone. I learned how to play saxophone. I could actually translate other music as I played it in my head to, anyway, but you talk about out of sight, out of mind, you lose it, you, you use it, you don't use it, you lose it, all that. I, I couldn't even, I, I couldn't even set the thing up right now, which is kind of a bummer too. That's a lost talent. Um, That's awesome though, man. And again, Chuck, thanks again, buddy. Um, Cody saying, been trying to get my friend to one of your live shows because a lot of the things I apply are from you. Uh, so one of these days, I'm gonna get him onto your show. Nice, man, I appreciate that, buddy. Chuck saying, Rush is sick. Yeah, Getty Lee is killer for sure. The thing is, I so I never since I never really had lessons or you know I I didn't know anything about what I was doing. I would just kind of you know kind of sort something out. Um, I, I I never really got to explore a lot. I mean, I would just like I say, I would listen just whatever I would listen to. I would try to mimic it with, with very very low percentage of success. Which is cool. Hey, listen, here's, okay, so, but but to that point, though, it's, I don't know that it's anything I would ever want to learn. See, for me, I, I like knowing something. There's a couple of things that I would like to learn how to do just so I could do it for my own satisfaction and knowing how to do it. But there's certain things that I don't want to know because I want the magic to be there. Like, to me, musicians, those People are magic. I, you know, I know that there's skill and I know that there's practice and I know that there's sacrifice and drive and there's 
a lot that goes into it, but the final result is magic to me. And I mean that sincerely um, because it's something that I know that I can't do. I don't want to know how to do it. I want to watch guys that are really good at it because, you know, so it's kind of like with the whole tuning or car thing. I know how to do all that. That's cool. Okay. I figured that stuff out, but it's more fun when you absolutely have no idea. So it's like gymnasts to me are magic period. That's all there is. When you can flippy floppy and, and do the tricks and, and, and do all that and you land and you're, that, that to me is magic. You have to be like magic. People can do that kind of stuff and being able to play instruments like just pro musicians that that's all. And the other thing is actual magicians. So one thing I don't like is like, I, it's kind of neat to know how the magic is done. Like card tricks, for example, I love card tricks. I am, I am a sucker for up close and personal magic too, whether they're popping a, a ring through a string or a stick or, you know, they alakazam and, you know, pull a, a, you know, a dime out of your nose or whatever, it, whatever it is. I love that kind of stuff because I love the sleight of hand and I love the setup. I know that it's a setup. I know that it's really not a random deck of cards. I know, but I love and professional wrestling, it's all magic to me. Anyway, stunt show. I know it's not real, but I like, it's just fun, right? So anyway, it's entertaining. And um, and I don't want to be the, I don't want, I want to, I would, it's it's cooler to be entertained, but know the, the work that goes into it. Like the card trick thing. So anyway, getting back to that. One of the things about card tricks is they're they're actually it, it takes so much skill just like playing guitar it's so much skill the way you hold your fingers on the deck the way that you can grab manipulate move and all this other stuff these cards with your fingers and placing cards and being able to all of that is super crazy awesome cool and that's part of the setup that's part of the skill set that it takes to do all that and they do it just like on accident seemingly right like oh wow look here's your card Duh, who knew it Anyway, that kind of stuff blows my mind, and I love that. And, it, and it's one of those things where I love I, – I am really happy to not know how to do it because, to me, knowing how the trick works, I, all I will do is just appreciate the fact that the setup was so cool coming into the – you know, the, the actual performance itself. Yeah. I, I, I can understand anyway. I'm kind of way off track here, but, uh, six Henry power saying, Dr. Mason, what's up? Oh, I got the arm flex. <laughs> Chuck saying, sorry to go way off top of me. No, no, it's cool, man. Listen, you know, it, it get, but it plays in, it, it, it isn't, I mean, it's off, but it's, it's not, I mean, it's, you know, we're still talking about skill sets. We're still talking about practice and the work that you put into it. And, uh, you know, how long does it take to, you know, figure out the the thing that you're working with? It's all the same thing, really. Uh, but for me, it's just, you know, different things that I'm into and stuff that, you know, I just kind of squirrel, you know, and I just, you know, the distractions for me. But uh, yeah, no, I love it, man. That stuff's fun for me. <laughs> Gary saying, same can be said about UB and tuning magic. I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> but uh Oh, Chuck saying uh, uh, at Raging depends on you. Know, he's hanging out with Raging. Um, Ibanez has some great beginner options. Uh, I use USA Fender, but those are expensive. True that. Oh, Cody saying, speaking of fighting, who you got tonight? Masvidal or Covington? Man, I tell you what, I would like to see Masvidal win. And I would like to see Masvidal win just because... Dude, Street Jesus is pretty freaking cool in my book. Covington has a real good. In fact, I got to jump off of here pretty quick because I, I got to start getting the live stream. I mean, the the pay per view going. Um, but here's the thing: Covington's got a skill set and a gas tank that is just sick to death. I I think that 
I think that Masvidal is going to be a better wrestler than Kobe has envisioned. I think that Kobe's going to be a better striker than, Ma than Masvidal has envisioned. And I think it's going to be a good fight. What I'm hoping doesn't have this is what sucks with with any with any of these fights is that these guys are tuned up to such a high level. I'm just hoping, and I don't, it's not going to happen with Covington, but I'm just hoping that it doesn't. So Masvidal's got a weird kryptonite. If if you watch any of his fights and you look at any of the analysis of his fights, if he he will. Okay, so watch watch some of the watch some of the analysis. If if the other fighter will come in and, and you go just basic one two, okay, basic stuff one two, Masvidal can handle that. But if you throw faint and then throw the two, I think he's been I think if I'm not mistaken, he's been caught with that a couple of times. And if it wasn't, it was like a setup, but it wasn't even a setup. It was basically catching him, getting getting him to react to what is going to be the jab, and then that two just comes straight behind it. And I know he's been caught with that. I know Covington's probably going to implement that at least at least a dozen times in this fight. He's going to try to do that. It's a timing thing, and and the thing is, it's not like it's even a the who is he fighting? God, I can't remember. The, the daggum one I was watching, I was going, oh, shoot. Because I'm it, one, of, one of the things, I, I it's actually kind of weird because it's, a, oh, I can relate with that setup. Anyway, long story short, I know that that's going to be something that Covington's going to throw, and we'll, we'll see what happens, it, especially if he drops it from a southpaw stance. It's going to be really hard to deal with. But I'd like to see Masvidal. My, if 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 Masvidal wins the fight, I'm gonna say it's probably gonna get drug into in, into a decision. If Covington wins, uh if Covington wins, it'll be like by fourth round submission or something like that, or uh, 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 third round submission would be my guess. Uh, let's see. Oh, I didn't even see Chuck's uh, or Raging Bull's question. Uh, good base. Oh, okay, that's where that came from. Okay, um, Raging Bull said I'd spend up to three to four hundred bucks. Oh, an SR three hundred. Man, that, I've heard about that one. Talk about the base. Good base to learn on. Oh, Chuck's saying, uh, funny how I was set in Nitto's and proved my RT Shaker's performance for sure on that. Cody's saying, Cody's got that E85 in his gas tank. Chuck's saying, I need to watch part two from B's Race. So, Chuck, here's the funny thing about that one. So, um, I I've got to give you the setup because I, I, was, I really wasn't setting it up as I was filming it. Um, I'll, I'll typically... I, I don't really, I won't really show the cards too much on a video like that, but here's the deal. I, what happens a lot with my car for whatever reason is I end up getting guys that will posture up wanting to run my car. And I couldn't tell if that CTSV was doing that, but it just so happened that it ended up to where that's what ended up happening is that I ended up running this guy and a CTSV when it basically looks like it's filming a car chase scene, this, Oh, that's something else too. I mentioned that <clears throat> vibrating toothbrush looking thing that it had sitting in the back with a little green flashing light. That's one of those cameras where it will, it will pan and show basically everything. Um, and you can adjust it. I guess through editing to where it just kind of locks in on a target or whatever. I don't know how it works. I don't have one. I have no idea the specifics. Anyway, I know kind of what it's there to do though. Um, but he had, a, he had other GoPros on the car and like a GoPro looking at me, I thought, and all this other stuff and, and, you know, a little green blinking light. And all I can think of was when I was sitting there and I'm kind of talking and I mentioned the CTSV maybe once or twice. And I think I even said those things are either like, you know, 11 second cars or nine second cars, or I said something to that effect. But one thing was for damn sure, I was not going to lose the race on the tree. That was not going to happen. 
So um, let me think about this for a minute. I the, the truck in front of me left. And at first I thought that they weren't going to call us in. Then they finally called us in. That's why you hear me go, oh, okay, they're calling us in. And so he starts the burnout. I start the burnout. He stages. I pre-stage. He goes into stage and basically puts it on the either a, on a two-step or he was in, in on the converter. And I just kind of kind of crawl into the <laughs> crawl into my my staging my staging beam. Yellow, 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 and um, green. And anyway, long story short, I dropped a 007 reaction time on him because I knew for a fact that if that thing did hook and did launch, he was going to give me all I could handle and probably then some with all the cameras that he had attached to this thing. Let me just put it to you like this. By the time that race ended, that green flashing light was probably not green and flashing anymore. And um, it won't be being put on the YouTubes or the Instawebs, I'm sure. Uh, I, I looked to me on the time slip like he might have spun a little bit, but even if that were the case, he didn't have enough in the tank to try to reel me in on the back half. Um, and uh, Or something didn't happen. Nitrous didn't fire or who knows what. Anyway, long story short, uh, fun fun race. And I was, so I, I took it like he was posturing up to try to run me. And my reaction Let's just say that it is uh, animated at best in car. Chuck, thank you. Saying, hope my contribution helped me. To, uh, yeah, big time. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that a million times over. Um, got to saying, got to head out. Uh, catch you on the next show. Thank you, brother. Again, man. I mean, a very generous man. I really do appreciate it uh, more than you know. Just. It, it's, it's a lot. I, believe me, I know. Thank you. Um, Chuck saying, smash the like button, folks. Yeah, hit that like, subscribe, share. But no, man, it, it helps more than more than you know, man. Thank you very much. Um, Sovereign saying, sup, B? What's up, Sovereign? Sovereign saying, got a moment to hang out on the chat. <laughs> Cody's saying, I'm going to be honest. I feel like I'm a red light on my first pass because I've never been to the strip yet. Um, trying, trying to get the timing down on the light. So once you, once you do get the timing down, it's all about how you stage the car. But uh, the main thing is when you see the yellow, you know, the third yellow, in essence, yellow, yellow, yellow. When you see the yellow come on, when it actually goes on, then go ahead and hit the throttle. Uh, that'll give you enough time for rollout to get you past the beams and, and get you on your way. It won't be the best, but it will at least get you in practice with working at the light. Then you can work on staging the car a little bit shallower, a little bit deeper. And, um, and, and obviously, you know, how you react to that yellow is going to be a big indicator as far as being able to cut a specific light. Um, I am real quick and real hard on the light. So I actually have to be careful with how I stage my car. If I go too deep, I will absolutely red light. So if, if I'm trying to really cut a number on the tree, if I'm trying to cut a super low reaction time, I've got to be real cognizant of the fact of where I am in space um, when I stage the car. So, and this is a weird thing too, but it's a, it, it's you talk about like how far you travel in like if you're going 10 miles an hour you're you're actually thinking about term things in terms of like two to three inches and in, yeah, forward or back can make the difference you know cutting a, a red light or cutting a really really good light so um I'm kind of food for thought on that and again, Chuck, brother, man, I really do appreciate that a ton, big time. Um, man, that is huge. Modern Red, thank you too, buddy. I really appreciate the contributions, guys. Um, 
But hopefully I was able to bring something cool for you guys tonight. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here pretty quick. But uh, thank you guys again. I really do appreciate y'all a ton, more than you know, actually. Uh, love each and every one of you guys. Could not, would not do this without you. Y'all get out there and do something cool for somebody, man. Chances are they need it more than you know. And uh, Ray Missing, love you, brother. And with that, I got to call it a night. Catch you guys on the next one. And that's a wrap. Adios.